test, test. Testing, testing. No mic? Okay, welcome to class. Looks like the mic isn't working, so we'll shout today. Thanks for bearing with me, the sub. Just, uh, I won't tell Jeff how you voted, but thumbs up, thumbs down, was it okay? Thumbs up, thumbs down. That's uh, kind of a split. <laughs> More thumbs up than thumbs downs. Okay, well, I apologize I couldn't make a video in time. It's been a bad week in the Sparks home. It's been, I'll just say this, if you ever have kids, just buckle up. You're gonna get, you're gonna puke, you're gonna puke all the time. Because kids are adorable little germ factories that just bring germs into your home. So, that's where we've been. Okay. I'm going to, these are the following things we want to learn about today. Technically, we, we had one last thing I wanted to cover from chapter three. So I'm going to say a few words about glasses. Then we're going to pick up where Jeff left off. And I think he told me the last thing he talked about was PMMA. Did you actually talk about PMMA or did you stop there? You stopped there. So we'll talk about PMMA. We'll talk about a few of the other polymers that I think you ought to be at least familiar with. Things like Bakelite, Nylon. Uh, PET, PC. Um, we're going to dive into things on how we characterize polymers. There's one thing to say what the repeat unit is, but what else can we say about them? There's something called molecular weight. There's degree of polymerization. There's the shape of the polymer. We're going to talk about all those things. There's, if there's these side groups, we need to decide what if they're on the same side versus different sides. Uh, that's something we're going to have to talk about. Um, a quick announcement tonight. Um, there's going to be an extra review session because the TAs are amazing and out of the goodness of their hearts they're going to hold an extra review session so thanks for doing that. From 7 to 9 p.m. so it's late um, that'll be here to my knowledge in this room. Um, the homework and the class notes are posted with the exception of homework 5 solutions which will be posted right after class so everything should be available. I did a midterm review yesterday. If there's questions that I didn't answer in that video, shoot me an email, comment on the YouTube video, whatever you want to do, start a discussion thread, whatever you want, and I'll answer them either on the discussion thread. If it merits making another brief video, I can do that. Uh, we want to make sure you have a chance to have your questions answered. So if you have questions, ask them. So let's pick up with the last thing of chapter three. Um, we just finished talking about diffraction, and then we ended class. We didn't have time to talk about non-crystalline materials, which we also call glasses, right? Okay. So if you take a material and it has a unit cell, what we said about a unit cell is that that can be translated to fill all space. Like you can make a wallpaper out of it just by translating it. Translating means moving it side to side or up to down, up and down. Okay. So that's pretty easy to see in this example of crystalline SiO2. Right? You've got a repeat structure that you could move throughout space. Actually, that's not the smallest unit cell. The smallest unit cell would be this one here. Right? That thing could be translated to fill all space. Right? But the point is that that thing has a repeating structure that can fill all space. Now look over here. In this glass, that's not the case. If you zoom in and look only locally, these things look pretty same. Right? Locally, you've got your SiO4 tetrahedra, right? These things, that's one silica, and it's surrounded by four oxygen. So it's SiO4, four, four minus. It's a polyanion. And those things are corner shared. And on average, the average might be six member rings, right? Here you've got like, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six. That's a six member ring. But you're gonna have other ones which aren't that, right? You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So locally, they look the same, but they don't have that translational symmetry because they don't have long-range crystalline order. That's the only difference between these, right, is whether it has long-range order or not. And so you might think at first glance, like, well, does that really make that big of a difference? It makes a huge difference, right? So imagine for a minute, if I was trying to make atoms slide past one another, right? If I was trying to make atoms slide past one another, here, there's at least like pathways 
where you can imagine the bonds could slide past one another with a little bit more ease without bumping into another atom. But that's just not the case here. Here it's so random that we know at least for one thing the mechanical properties should be very, very different for these things, and they are. So uh, the, the MSE students that have the lab for this class, last week they were making glass. They actually made glass themselves. This is not what they made. Um, they actually made glass of different types. They heated up and melted it. They cast it into things, and they looked at the stresses that get generated. We'll be talking about that a little bit more later this semester. But what they're seeing here is not the glass they made, but they did cut this glass, right? And one thing that's interesting, when you don't have repeating long-range structure, then you don't have grain boundaries, right? We don't have grain boundaries. You don't have them the material cleaving on surfaces preferentially. And so what can happen is you can take glass, which they bought from a store, they can scrape the surface with a diamond scribe, right? They can scratch it in a very specific way. They can bend it and they can get it in an ideal world, so I can tell you how actually it works, right? To break right along the part that you cleave. So you can actually make rounded edges. You can make bent and curved edges. Um, normally, you take a piece of glass and you drop it, it just shatters into baz bazillion pieces. Um, but if you can control that process by adding a surface flaw and making that crack propagate along that, you can actually make it do cool things. You can make stained glass, you know, and then you can cover the edges with carbon ta or copper tape. You can then solder those together and you can make pretty cool things, which, you know, they made this just last week. And not, a, not like even a lot of time, okay? So that is glasses. Um, the, the main idea, we call this lack of long range order, we call that amorphous. You either have crystalline materials or you have amorphous materials, right? So what's the difference? How do you make sure, like if you want glass that's SiO2 versus having quartz, the chemical structure is the same, right? So how do you get one and not the other? Maybe turn to a neighbor. How would you get one and not the other? If you wanted quartz, how would you get quartz? And if you wanted glass, how might you get glass? Maybe tell a neighbor what you think, what you might do. What do you think, Thomas? What do you do? Not sure? OK. Without confidence? Here, here's a tip. How could you use temperature? Or let me ask you this, if you heat something up and it's melted, and you quench it, which structure do you think you're more likely to get? Quench it means cool it down as fast as possible. All right, what do you guys think? M Mitch? Is it Mitch? Mitch is here. Matt? Dane. Dane, not even close. All right, Dane, Kayla, and Ashton. All right, what do you think? How do you get a glass? Yeah. Yeah, time is the key word there. If you imagine both of those being molten for a minute, molten means the atoms are floating around, they're not in any sort of long range order. If you froze that structure, which one does it look more like? The glass. So if you quench it, you're essentially freezing that structure. Yeah, you got it. Okay, what do we think? How do you get quartz and how do you get glass? Because quartz, you know, glasses, if, you, if your grandma has a set of quartz glasses, those are very expensive. They do things that regular glass doesn't do, like you make like the, the noise when you, if you're obnoxious and you, you know, get your finger wet and do the thing. You guys know what I'm talking about. Um, but glass doesn't do that as well, right? Okay? So how do you get one versus the other? Any thoughts? Kobe, I can see it. I, can, I see the gears turning. Pressure. Pressure. Those are always good guesses. Right, because those have to do with energy. Let me ask you this. If I heat glass up to the point where it's molten, will it have long range order or will the atoms be floating past one another? Floating past one another, right? So liquid looks more like which of these two? Looks more like the glass, I agree. Therefore, if I were to quench this thing, if I could just hit the brakes on that and cool it down very, very quickly, am I more likely to get quartz or glass? glass. So quenching things from high temperatures is how you get glasses. And I forgot to bring it, but you don't have to just do this with like things like silicon dioxide, right? You can do it with metals. Um, nowadays there's liquid metals. I'll bring this to next class. I forgot to bring it today. But you can take a metal, you take a bunch of different types of metals, you melt them together, 
you cool it down as fast as possible and instead of it organizing into a nice arrangement of say FCC or BCC or whatever the metal structure is, you just get a hodgepodge of atoms in every which, you know, all over the place and how is that going to change your properties? If I have it, so I'll bring this next time, but you can take two pucks that look the same, they're both metal, you can take marbles and I can drop them, one of them bounces like crazy and one of them like thud, 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 thud and it's done. Right? So the glass is the one that bounces like crazy. And the reason why is metals are easy to dent and deform. And the reason why is exactly what I said. You've got these planes, which we call slip planes. They're regions where you can make atoms slide past each other. When you make atoms slide past each other, you absorb energy. And so if you have a glass and it doesn't have those planes, those slip planes where it's easy to deform it, then you don't deform it. If you don't deform it, you don't absorb that energy. If you don't absorb the energy, it has to go somewhere, so it bounces back up. And it looks like magic. So I'll bring this next class. Yeah, Connor? Um, there's like a glass structure. It's like it's kind of like a teardrop, but it's like indestructible until you like clip the top of it. Who sent me the video of that? Was that Ashton? Josh? Somebody sent, so we did that in our lab last week, and somebody sent me the video. I will post it on Canvas. It's called a Prince Rupert Droplet. So you take a little bit of glass, you pour it into liquid, and it, you can hit the bulk of it. It looks like a droplet shape, like a tear. And if you hit the tear with a hammer, it won't break. But if you clip just the tail of it, anybody, if anybody's seen the Smarter Everyday video of this, he does like a gazillion frames per second camera, and you can see it moving. And it's insanely fast. This crack propagates from the tail to the bulk, and then it explodes. We did it in just regular iPhone slow-mo camera, so you can't actually see anything that amazing. But I will post it, and we won't explain how that works yet, but later on in this class, we will talk about it. It's called tempered glass. Okay? So hang on to that thought. Ashton. I just had a question about the difference between how come, is it easier to forget glass because it's so small and amorphous than metal because metals are singular atoms instead of a compound? Great, great question. It's really hard to get an amorphous or a glass metal um, for a lot of reasons. First off, their formation energy, the energy of formation, so the driving force is really big for them to form crystalline structures. So there's a big driving force. They're simple structures that form, right? Um, they're individual atoms as opposed to groups of polyanions, right? So all of that makes it really easy for them to organize really quickly. It's much harder for this to organize because these are polyanions, right? It's SiO4 that are clumps together. It's a more, dis it's a much more complex structure, right? This thing is much more complex than FCC, right? So all these things work in your favor when you make a glass out of um, these materials as opposed to metals, right? Um, that said, even quenching things isn't the best way to make glasses. Instead, we add what are called network modifiers. As the name suggests, you take a network, right? Some repeating structure, we're gonna modify it, we're gonna mess it up, right? So things like B2O3, that's boron oxide, or germanium oxide, calcium, sodium oxide. These things are all network modifiers and they're common to glass, right? So we call them, uh, for example, you've probably heard of soda lime glass before. That sounds at least kind of familiar. The windows on your home are soda lime glass. That is SiO2, but it's mixed with soda, Na2O, and lime, CaO. I don't know who named these things, but that's soda and that's lime, right? You add these things and what it does is let's say if you put a big sodium ion in the middle of this thing and a big calcium two plus ion in there, it messes with this thing's ability to form the nice six membered repeating rings because now you've got this additional charge that throws things off. So adding a little bit of sodium and car or calcium, those turn out to be really good ways to make quartz and turn it into glass. They also help by lowering the melting temperature. Normally quartz doesn't melt until 1050 Celsius. Uh, it's a high temperature. You can't get that with propane torch. You have to use an oxygen hydrogen torch, which, you know, you can get those, but it's a pain in the butt and it makes it very expensive to work with it. But regular glass, soda lime glass, melts at, I think, six or 700. It, it melts at a much lower temperature. And the reason why is because by alloying it, right, making a mixture with these different elements lowers the melting point. And the reason why? Because there's a eutectic, right? It's heading towards this eutectic that, that lowers the melting temperature. So um, there's other things that you can do that modify the structure. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about glasses later when we talk about viscosity, but that's at least a primer for now that not all solid matter is crystalline. There's a whole bunch of things that are glassy, right? If you've ever seen like obsidian stones, obsidian, when you break it, it looks like a dinner plate broke or like a glass broke because it is a glass, right? It's a rock, 
but it's a glassy, amorphous rock, right? So there's crystalline and there's not crystalline. And then there's polymers, which Jeff talked about last class. Can I answer any questions about anything that Jeff covered? He talked about um, the very simple polymers, like methane, ethane, propane, which are really short chain length. And then he talked about the ones that are much longer chain length, which we give special names to. Uh, he talked about polymerization. And then he talked about things like polyethylene, polytetrafluoroethylene, which we call Teflon. Talked about PVC, polypropylene, polystyrene. Are there any questions I can answer about those? Can I just say how amazing it is that we live at the cusp of like an entirely new world? Like this was less than 100 years ago. None of these things existed that absolutely surround us. Everything, the tiles I'm walking on, this table, the clothes I'm, well, maybe this is probably cotton. It's been around for a while, but <laughs> pretty much everything, right? This stuff. This stuff, none of this existed 100 years ago. Most of it didn't exist 50 years ago. In our lifetimes, or at least old people's lifetimes, this stuff came online, and it is absolutely everywhere. And every day we're discovering new polymers that boggle imagination, what they can do for us. So I'm not overhyping this when I say that polymers are amazing. They're absolutely amazing what they can do for us, right? And uh, we can only scratch the surface of the different polymers that exist. In the 70s, they discovered polymers that conduct electricity, right? All of a sudden, you can have phones, you can have solar cells that are made of organic polymeric materials that can be bent and flexed, right? When you watched your sci-fi movie, Take Your Pick, from 10 years ago, and they showed a newspaper that was like a tablet but could be folded up, this is around the corner. This is not that far away in the future, and it's because we're understanding polymers better and better, right? So I'm just giving you a few of like the, like the America's most wanted of polymers, right? But there's a lot of other ones out there that we're not going to cover in this class. Ashton? Um, I just have a question about, uh, is polymers are only carbon, carbon hydrogen plus other stuff? So carbon fiber wouldn't be a polymer? Good question. So how do you define polymers is, is a great question. It likes ceramics. If I tried to define a ceramic, there's not one definition that's going to satisfy all the types of things that we call a ceramic, right? I could say a ceramic is a um, melts at a high temperature, but ice is a ceramic, right? And ice melts at a very low temperature. You could say, okay, well, it's a brittle material, but then you've got that YSC that's toughened by zirconia, or, sorry, yttria stabilized zirconia. That's our ceramic steel we talked about. That's a tough one. So there's exceptions to all these rules. Polymers are no, no different. Most of the time we say polymers are what? Typically, they're hydrocarbons, but that's definitely not all of them, right? There's, there's things that break that rule. Some of them don't have hydrogen at all. Take Teflon, right? Teflon, if you remember from last class, Teflon looks like this. It's, it's a carbon-carbon backbone, but it's the thing sticking off the side, there's no hydrogen at all, all fluorine, right? That's why it's so chemically inert, and it doesn't react with anything, because fluorine can't be bothered, right? Once it gets its electron from carbon, it's chill. It doesn't want to react with anything, which makes it so great for cooking on and all sorts of other things, right? Did he show you the video of the gecko trying to climb it? No. Oh, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff. Come on. It is the only surface on the planet that a gecko can't climb. And he's not going to show you that? <laughs> Tough luck, gecko. <laughs> right? No metal, no ceramic, no... Nothing else can do that. So polymers can do things that, that regular materials cannot do, right? Um, how else do, would you define a polymer? You'd say low melting point. But carbon fiber is considered a ceramic, right? Or a polymer. And it melts at extremely high temperatures, right? So there's not one definition. There's trends. In general, what can we say about polymers? From your own experience, what can we say about polymers? Josh, did I see a hand back there? It is susceptible to creep, and we'll talk about why by the end of class today when we talk about cross-linking. Okay? Yeah, Thomas? What about the carbon? Do they have to have carbon? It doesn't even have to have carbon technically. There's something called a geopolymer. Let me pull it up. Geopolymer. I'm like one of the ten people on the planet that Googles this. <laughs> but here it is. Here's our geopolymer, if I can zoom in on this. This is a polymer. Um, it can be formed, and if you look, it's a series of repeating units, right? But there's no carbon here. It's silicon, oxygen, aluminum, oxygen, silicon, oxygen, silicon, right? So it's made of silicon, aluminum, and oxygen, 
but it's amorphous. It's amorphous. If this thing crystallized into a crystal structure, we'd call it a ceramic. But because it's totally amorphous, and because it can be polymerized in a chain reaction, some people consider this a polymer, right? It's a geopolymer, okay? So there's not one good definition for polymer. In general, we can say what, though? What can we say about polymers? Long chains are a typical hallmark of polymers. What else? Is that it? Did Jeff fail me so badly? What else? What else can we say about polymers? They melt at high temperatures or low temperatures, typically? Yeah, anybody who's melted G.I. Joe man with a magnifying glass, right? Sid from Toy Story, definitely not me, maybe, right? <laughs> then you know that they melt at a low temperature. What else? They are typically organic, meaning they have carbon in them. Not always, but typically. What else? Are they tough or weak? Well, that's, that's two different questions. Weak has to do with strength. Are they strong or weak? Are they tough or brittle? Two different questions. They are more tough than some ceramics, right? Generally speaking, they can be kind of tough, um, but they're not very strong. You can break a, a rubber band. You can break a piece of... If this was metal, I probably couldn't break it very easy, but I can break this no problem with the, as a plastic, right? So those are general quali qualities, but there's exceptions to all these, okay? Okay, let's dive into... I'm assuming that he covered these things. If you have questions on any of these ones that he covered, I can talk more about them. Let's talk a little bit about PMMA. PMMA is called acrylic glass. That's, if you ever heard of people talking about acrylic, acrylic is this. It's you, you start out with your, your carbon backbone. By the way, anytime you see this backbone drawn without the carbons there, it just means it's carbon. If they write silicon or sulfur or something, then it's not carbon, it's what they write. But if they don't write anything, assume it's a carbon, okay? And if they draw this out here, that means it's carbon as well. And carbon, we know, has to have four bonds, so that really means CH3, right? So let me give myself some room, and I'll draw that, right? This thing is technically, that's a CH3 at the end there. This would also be one of those, okay? Um, so the backbone is carbon, but you've got two different side groups. Well, first off, you've got this side group. This is just hydrogen and hydrogen. That looks like polyethylene, right? That's not too interesting. But over here, you've got the, the methyl group on one side, right? A methyl group, which is a CH3 unit. And then on the other side, you've got methacrylate, probably, right? Because this is polymethyl methacrylate. So that, I am not a polymers guy, but even I can guess that the name of this unit is probably methacrylate from the name, right? Any organic chemist going to corroborate that claim? All right, it's, it's, it's uncorroborated, but I think that's what it is, okay? Um, they call it acrylic glass because it tends to be not very tough. It's pretty brittle. As polymers go, it's more brittle than many of them. In fact, if you take a, plain, a plate of it and you flex it, it'll probably snap, whereas polyethylene, polytetrafluoroethylene, uh, these things, if you were to flex them, they don't snap very easily. They're much more tough. Um, Okay, so that's PMMA. It's used for a lot of uh, things. They use it in like, they use it as a binder in dental adhesives, right? When they make synthetic uh, fillings in your teeth, PMMA is part of that process. They use it for actually quite a few things, okay? Um, the next one we're going to talk about, let's see. So first off, it's lightweight. Um, it's slightly better than glass when it comes to shatter resistance, but it still shatters. Um, it's a good alternative to polycarbonate if you don't need the strength of polycarbonate talk about polycarbonate in a minute. Next up, we've got Bakelite. Bakelite, if you've ever seen anything in your grandma's house and it looks plastic, it's probably Bakelite because this is one of the early polymers that we discovered, right? Long before we knew Nylon 6.6 and Delrin and all these like commodity polymers that are around us today, this is one of the originals, right? And they used to make jewelry out of it. They made old clunky phones out of it. They made everything out of it, like 50s era consumer goods Bakelite was your go-to. That's why it was called the material of a thousand uses. We don't use it as much. The real, world for, real word for it is phenylformaldehyde, which maybe some people have heard of before, phenylformaldehyde. Um, how it works, this one's fundamentally different than the ones that he's showed you thus far in that this one's not just a chain. This is the first example of a polymer that's a three-dimensional network polymer. So network polymer. 
right? It forms a network like this. It has this uh, sort of benzene looking ring. That circle in the middle means that there's alternating double bonds all the way around that. I'm not going to test you on that in this class. Don't worry about it. It just means there's alternating. It's resonant structure. The, the double bonds move around. It's got a CH2 unit. It's got a CH2 unit. It's got a CH2 unit. And then all these other ones are, let's see what's up top. I think it's an OH. Yeah. It's got an OH up top. And the rest of these are just hydrogen. Okay. So because of that, these carbons out on the ends, they've got room to bond, right? They're not fully satisfied. They don't have the four bonds that carbon wants to have. On three ends of this repeat unit, it can bond with other things. On all the polymers you've seen up until now, it's been able to bond in, two dimen in one dimension, right? On two sides, so one dimension, right? In a line. All these things, it can bond on the left or the right, but it can't bond left, right, and up or down, right? This thing changes that. This structure can be put together in three dimensions. Because it can form three-dimensional bonds, and these are strong bonds. These are covalent bonds. Carbon bonded to another carbon, that's a strong bond, relatively speaking. Do you make a pretty strong, robust polymer? And Bakelite is a pretty strong, robust polymer. It's way stronger, way more creep resistant, way tougher than, say, something like polyethylene, right? Um, it also has a higher melting point. Turn to your neighbor and discuss why should this have a higher melting point, like drastically higher than polyethylene. Quick reminder, if you don't remember what polyethylene was, polyethylene is just carbon bonded to carbon with hydrogen on the sides. What do you guys think? Why is it so much higher melting point? Yeah. Yeah. When polyethylene melts, the chains just slide past each other. So the only thing you have to overcome is Van der Waals bonds. But these are covalent. It probably does. It probably does. But that's going to be weaker than your covalent bonds. Okay, what do we think? Why on earth is this going to be such a higher melting point polymer compared to the other ones we've seen so far? Yeah. I think that the, the network polymer characteristics make it almost like a crystal. Yeah. Yeah, so take regular polymers. As Jeff hopefully pointed out, these things are chains. And when they bond to each other, the reason they form solids as opposed to gases or liquids why they, they stay together in a structure is because what we call van der Waals bonding, right? Van der Waals bonding is between the chains and it might, do to, might be due to the fact that maybe you've got like a polar molecule here and so the polar like positive and negatives line up. It might be an induced dipole where just at any given moment in time the electrons fluctuate that way causing a slight positive which induces a negative, right? Those are really weak bonds, induced dipole bonds. But those are, the point is that these are weak bonds holding these chains together. Therefore, if you heat it up, you can overcome those bonds pretty easily, and that's why they melt pretty easily, right? Meanwhile, this thing is bonded with strong covalent bonds. Carbon bonded to another carbon is a strong bond, and if you want to melt it, there's no just overcoming van der Waals forces to slide past each other. You've got to break bonds, right? And so it's got a much higher melting point, okay? Okay, um, next up, let's talk about nylon 6-6, right? If you remember commercials from way back in your youth, probably before your time, yeah, question? Uh, how does the naming work on the called? Why is it called Bakelite? Um, so the, the, the real name for it is phenylformaldehyde, right? That's one that everyone can agree on. The, I think it was the trade name initially that Bakelite came on. And the reason why is because when you start out with the monomers, during the polymerization process, I don't know this, but I would guess there was like a baking step involved. They, took, they put in something that was liquid, they baked it, and out came something that was polymerized and was hard. But I will find out by next class about that. Oh, because you've got... I, I, I can't remember what a formaldehyde looks like. Let's pull it up. Formaldehyde. So formaldehyde, okay. So, okay, that makes sense. You've got... This thing, that's a formaldehyde unit. The oxygen double bonded onto there, right? And then if you take a phenol, or a phenol, let's see, radical. Let's see which ones. So here's your phenoxyl. Oh, guys, you asked, you, you've discovered my weakness. 
is polymers. I will find out my next class. I don't want to give you an unsatisfactory answer. So I won't give you an answer today. And I will come back with one next class. I will ask the polymer guru, which is Jeff, and he will tell you all about it. Or he will tell me all about it, and I'll tell you about it. OK? OK. So let's talk about Nylon 6.6. When I was a kid, there was commercials for the Bowflex, right? The ultimate workout instrument, the Bowflex. Bowflex is Nylon 6.6. That's what those things are made of, right? So what is, oh. I'm one too high. What is Nylon 6.6? Nylon 6.6 is right here. What's the name 6.6 there come from? If you look at it and you start counting carbons, you've got carbon, one, two, three, four, five, six. Then you've got a nitrogen, this amine group. Then you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, and then another amine group. So the 6.6 refers to these two groups of six carbon things, right? Um, that's, the full name is right there, polyhexamethylene adipamide, right? And an organic chemist could break that down, why that structure means this name, but I'm not going to. What I will say about it is that nylon 6.6 makes for good fibers because it has quite high strength. This is a high strength polymer, right? You can make ropes out of it. You can make carpers, carpets out of it. You can make zip ties out of it. Make all sorts of things out of it. Um, what's cool about it is that when you make it, the polymerization involves uh, these two different monomers that get joined together. So hopefully last class, Jeff talked about polymerization from one monomer, that it's this chain reaction that attacks another monomer and joins it to the chain, that attacks another one. This is maybe the first one we've talked about in this class where it's two different monomers that come together, right? And so when you make it, you have to start out with monomers of each of these, and then they react with one another. Ashton, do you have a question? Uh, that seems like a great explanation to me, but I don't know offhand for sure if that's right. I believe that's right, but I'm not going to confirm it just yet because, again, polymers are my Achilles heel. I don't know as much about them. I'm, I'm in awe of them, but I don't know as much about them, right? So when you make this thing, what they've done here is they've added the two different monomers in the solution, and they have different densities, and so they float on top of one another. They're going to reach in, and they're going to grab the interface with a pair of tweezers, and start pulling it out. As they pull it out, they're going to create new interface, and it's going to keep on polymerizing in real time. So you can see kind of the two layers there. The little white film at the interface, that's nylon 6.6 that formed. A little bit of chemistry. There's our two different monomers up there. Now he's going to grab that interface. We did this demo once, but it stinks bad. So we don't do it anymore in this class. We watch videos of it. But this is drawing a polymer. Oh, come on, man. Give it a minute. It's coming. It's coming. He's going to keep on winding that until you consume all of your reactants, right? When your reactants are consumed, your polymerization step is done here, right? So you can imagine this would be one way to make a rope of nylon. This is 610 instead of 66. It's, it's a close relative, right? Um, it's just by continuously drawing it. And you could make it as long as you want if you kept on adding more and more reactants to this. Now, you could imagine that doing this at different temperatures or different rates, lots of things could tell you whether you get a thick one or a bunch of really thin fibers, right? Um, polymers, another uh, characteristic of polymers that makes them so appealing nowadays, why we make them all over the place, is they're easy to process, right? A lot of that has to do with their low temperatures, right? It sucks to process ceramics because they melt at like, crazy temperatures, right? These things melt at very low temperatures, so it makes them easy to process, OK? All right. Um, you've got PET, polyethylene terephthalate, the same stuff that everyone's freaking, about, uh, freaking out about in their bottles. The reason why they're freaking out about them in their bottles is because PET itself was brittle. It's too brittle to work with. And so they added what's called a plasticizer. Plasticizer, as the name suggests, makes it a little more plastic. It adds a little bit of toughness and uh, ductility to it, but it also was leaching out. So if you had Tupperware made of PET plus plasticizer, the concern was if you nuke your food in the microwave, is that plasticizer going to leach out of the PET, right? Become unbonded to it, get in your food, you eat the food, cause cancer and all these things. So there's been a big um, BPA-free PET. Have you already seen these in labels? Am I the only one that notices this? BPA-free. Uh, BPA is bisphenyl alcohol. It's, it's a plasticizer that they add to PET to make it a little uh, more 
not, not so brittle, right? PET on its own is kind of brittle. Um, it's a great plastic though. It's a great substitute for glass. Um, it's used for a lot of things, mostly fibers and bottles. Uh, the last thing we're going to talk about today is polycarbonate. Polycarbonate's another fantastic material. If you look at it, it's more complicated. You've got oxygens along the main chain. You've got these benzene rings along the main chain. Um, this thing is great because it has, for a polymer, one of the highest impact resistances. That's why they can make bulletproof glass out of this stuff, right? Polycarbonate, bulletproof glass. If it's not tempered glass, then it's polycarbonate. It's extremely uh, fracture resistant. Um, it's actually not scratch resistant though. They made CDs out of it. Um, and it's actually pretty easy to scratch CDs because they're made of polycarbonate. And for that reason, they put a coating on them. They, they do a coating on the surface that makes it a little bit harder to scratch because scratch CDs are the worst, or they were the worst back when you used CDs. Okay. So that is, uh, you know, some of these things I think are reasonable to ask you to draw on a midterm. Other ones, no way. Like, I'm not going to make you draw nylon 66 or PMMA or PET. But some of these other ones, sure. Uh, polystyrene, that's easy. It's ethylene, polyethylene plus a benzene group. Polypropylene, that's easy. It's just a methyl group. You know, polytetrafluoroethylene, that's easy. So some of these things I might expect you to draw. The rest of them, I just want you to be familiar with them, okay? What are they used for? If I said on the test, which of the following polymers makes a great carpet? And I say polystyrene, polyethylene, or nylon 66, it's a no-brainer answer, okay? All right, how else do we characterize polymers? There's the repeat unit, which definitely matters. That characterizes the different types. But even within a same type, say Teflon, there's different grades. In fact, you've probably seen this. Who's got something made out of plastic? Who's got a plastic object? Can I look at it? How about this thing? What say on this? If you find something that's plastic and it has the recycle symbol, somebody find a recycle symbol for me. Yeah, right? So yeah, this one says BPA-free, because nowadays we're scared of BPA, probably with good reason. But this is PET. And it says um, it's the recycle symbol, and it has a number in the middle. And this one's hard to read. I think it's 7, right? That number corresponds to the type of polymer it is. Is it polyethylene or polycarbonate or PET? Um, that's so that recycle plant workers, right, can separate things pretty easily. Because if you're going to recycle these things, one of the great things about plastics is that they are, in general, much easier to recycle than other things, way easier than ceramics, right? Because they melt at low temperatures. But you don't want to mix up your different copolymers, right? What happens if I take some of my nylon 66 and melt it with some of my PET? I get some Franken polymer that maybe doesn't have the properties I want. So you need to separate these things out into different groups, and that's what that corresponds to. Now, sometimes you'll see that it says LDPE versus HDPE. Anybody seen that before? HDPE, LDPE. Those both have to do with polyethylene, but HD versus LD correspond to low density versus high density. What's the difference? It largely has to do with the molecular weight. The molecular weight takes into account that you can have long chains, or you can have short chains, right? You can have a chain that's a million units long, repeat units long, or you can have one that's only a thousand repeat units long. And the properties of those different length chains can be radically different, okay? So we need a way to talk about the length of chains. And then to make it even harder, when you actually make these things in a vat somewhere, when some chemical engineer cooks these things up for us, they don't make one single molecular weight. They make a range, right? And so we need to be able to report a range. So this is going to, on the y-axis, show the amount of polymer versus the molecular weight, and it's typically a distribution. It's not even necessarily a nice Gaussian distribution. It might be an asymmetric one, right? It could be whatever tricky distribution actually exists, right? So we need a way to talk about it, and there's two ways uh, that are commonly used. There's the weight average molecular weight, and there's the number average molecular weight, okay? The number average and the, and the weight average, here's the difference. The number average says if you could count up all the different strands of polymers and put them in bins, say all the polymers that are from 0 to 1,000, there's X amount. Then all the ones from 1,000 to 10,000, there's X amount. 10,000 to 100,000, right? You put them in bins based off of how many strands there are. If you could somehow count them, that would give you the number average molecular weight if you took the average based on that. But that's hard to do. It's way easier to do it based off of their weight. Right? You know that the shorter polymers weigh less, and so you can fraction those out differently. 
The longer ones weigh a little bit more, so you separate them out differently. So there's the weight average molecular weight and the number average molecular weight. Okay? So if the, if the amount of polymer is based off of number of chains, then the number, the, the number average molecular weight would be right at the top of that curve. Most of the time, that's not the case. You're dealing with the weight average, so it's going to be shifted to the right. And the reason why is because even though there's fewer chains that are a gazillion unit long, those weigh a ton more, and so it shifts your average over. Okay? So the way that we actually calculate this is as follows. If you want to calculate the number average molecular weight, then you need to sum up the number of strands that correspond to a certain number of repeat units. Again, if you had some way to do that, you could do this. It's tricky to do. It's easier to sum up the strands that correspond to a certain weight, and that's going to give you the weight average, molecular weight. Okay? In either case, once you know the molecular weight, we can calculate a degree of polymerization. And again, just like there's two different types of molecular weights, there's two different types of degree of polymerization. There's the number average and the weight average. If you take the overall chain length and you divide it by the repeat unit length, that's m, lowercase m with the bar, that's your average weight per repeat unit, that'll give you your number average degree of polymerization, n sub capital N. If you take the molecular weight based off the weight average and divide it by that same mer weight unit, it's going to give you the weight based uh, degree of polymerization, okay? So what is degree polymerization? All it is, it's telling you how many chains are, how many repeat units exist in your chain. Is it a million? Is it 10,000? That's what this number is, how many repeat units exist, okay? Now, some polymers have more than one repeat unit. They've got maybe alternating. Nylon 6.6 is a great example. Nylon 6.6, you can treat this thing all as one repeat unit, but technically it is made up of two smaller subunits that are repeating, right? So you can have polymers that are copolymers, we call them, meaning there's two different units. You can have many more than copolymers. There can be lots of them. In this case, this is an alternating copolymer because they alternate exactly every other time. But they don't have to be. They can be random. Let me see if I can get a picture of it. I got ahead of myself. But yeah, copolymers, you can take, like this would be nylon 6.6. They're alternating A, B, A, B, A, B. But they don't have to be like that. They can also be, you know, random, right? A, B, 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 A, B, A, B, A, A, right? Or you can have what's called block copolymers, where you have a block of one type, and then you get a block of another one that can be pretty big in size. Um, the ability to make polymers with all these different you know, varieties is why we can get so many interesting properties out of them, right? Solar cells and things like that out of, made out of polymer materials, one of the things that they're doing is they're taking advantage of block copolymers. Normally, solar cells have to have a junction of two dissimilar materials. We'll talk about this later on in this class. And here is your junction. You've got one material here, you've got another material right there. So it's built right into the chain is these junctions. So you can do some really cool stuff with these things, with copolymers. When it comes to calculating their molecular weight, we have to take that into account. So the average molecular weight for the mer is going to be the molecular weight of each monomer multiplied by the fraction of that. So if there's two polyethylenes and then there's a polypropylene, you could figure out what the mer, the mer weight is. It'd be two times the ethylene plus one times the polypropylene. That's going to be your overall M bar, your average mer weight. Okay? Any questions on molecular weight, on degree of polymerization? Okay, let's keep going we got a little more time. Let's end on this one. Let's do a clicker question. Top hat was not loading. We'll give it one last shot. But regardless, the question is the following. Which of the following has the highest degree of polymerization, average degree of polymerization, um, if these all have a number average molecular weight of a quarter million? If these all have a molecular weight of a quarter million, that should be grams per mole because this is describing a molecular weight. Which one of these has the most number of repeat units in the chain? So how would you answer this question? What's the approach? Turn to a neighbor and discuss how you might begin solving this question.
Okay, how would you go about tackling this question? Anybody have a thought? How might you go about it? Find the mass of what? So the total weight of the chain is the same for all of these. All the chains weigh roughly a quarter of a million grams per mole. But what's different is the number of repeat units for these four different ones, right? The reason for that is because the weight of this repeat unit is not the same for all four of them. Like the ones that have lots and lots of atoms are going to weigh more, right? Or the ones that have heavier atoms are going to weigh more. Like chlorine is like 35 on the periodic table, so it weighs as much as like, what, multiple three carbons, right? So what you need to do is you need to figure out which one of these has the lowest molecular weight on the Mer scale, right? Because what you're trying to figure out is which one has the highest average degree of polymerization. So that's this. In order that, for that to be as large as possible, you want this to be as small as possible. So you need to calculate lowercase m bar. And that's equal to the average, well, not the average. It's the weight of this Mer unit, right? So the approach to this problem, where we'll probably pick up next class when Top Hat's working, is we will calculate what's the repeat unit mass for all four of these and see which one's the lowest. And the lowest one is one that's going to have the most chains. The most, sorry, the most repeat units in the chain. Okay, we'll pick up here, uh, not on Friday. So real quick, again, the announcement is there's a review session tonight. I will not be here on Friday, but my TAs will be here. The test is on Friday. It'll be graded by Saturday, and then it's fall break, so we'll see you after the break.